Thank you for joining our session this morning, Keeping Farmers and Ranchers on the Land. I'm Dina Hoff. I'm a member of the Agricultural Task Force of Northern Plains, and I'm going to be introducing this session and our speaker this morning. In the United States, as in everywhere else around the world, uh, we're seeing a changing dynamic in land ownership. And rural spaces that were once farmed and ranched by families, uh, we now see that land changing hands and going into corporately owned entities, including investment firms, which is like companies that manage big pensions, even public employees' pensions are going to take land away from farmers and ranchers. Uh, we also see large scale private ownership. Bill Gates, for example, owns land somewhere in Montana and I know he owns land in the Red River Valley of North Dakota. And that means farmers and ranchers have less access to cultivate and graze and manage timber on US lands. And that is gonna reshape our rural communities and it also completely changed the ability of new and beginning farmers to get on the land and enter the profession. And also with the corporate acquisition of land goes water rights and timber rights and mineral rights, and perhaps diminished access to hunting and fishing and recreation. And this was not um, a campaign that Northern Plains has worked on in recent years. But we know that the issue of land grabbing fits in with our work on keeping corporations and individuals of immense wealth from gobbling up everything. And it, it is very entwined with all the work that we're doing. So we're gonna be hearing about um, solutions to these problems and hopefully it will be inspired to take action. So we're hoping that this session is gonna expand your understanding of land grabbing and the impacts of corporate ownership on family, farmers, ranchers, and rural communities. So we have a really fantastic speaker for you this morning, Jordan Treacle. He is the National Programs and Policy Coordinator with National Family Farms Coalition. And before I introduce Jordan, I think it's important to note that Northern Plains was a founding member of the National Family Farm Coalition in 1986. And our very own Helen Waller was the very first president of the National Family Farm Coalition. And personally, I am on the executive committee of the National Family Farm Coalition. And I am also a member of the committee on land grabbing. Um, also, I have had the privilege of representing Via Campesina or Northern of the coalition, including representing all of you as part of the National Family Farm Coalition on La Via Campesina, which works with burdened farmers and ranchers and small fishers and ag workers all over the world who are facing the same problems from the same corporations and the same wealthy individuals and um, corporations who are putting their money together to buy up all the resources in the world. So I wanna tell you a little bit about Jordan. He is all coming to us by Zoom all the way from the United Nations in Europe today. And he has worked with family farmers and ranchers in rural communities and social and economic um, issues for beginning in 2008. He began working with the Rural Advancement Foundation International USA to lead grassroots organizing efforts to strengthen farmers' land rights in the southeastern United States in response to predatory practices by fossil fuel industry. In 2012, he shifted his professional focus to um, international policy arena with the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, where he worked with civil society organizations to promote agroecology, strengthen smallholder producer organizations, and implement community land rights initiatives in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. 
Jordan holds a mass, joint master of science in international rural development from Wageningen University in the Netherlands and received his BA in international studies from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He's originally from the mountains of Western North Carolina and currently based in Washington, DC and has worked with the coalition and I've been happy to work with him since 2019. So welcome, Jordan. We're happy to have you. Where Thank you so that? much, Dina. Uh, there's a little bit of feedback. Can you all hear me okay? Uh, maybe Dina, you can give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Always trying to navigate the Zoom technology issues. So I'm assuming that you all can hear me all right. So uh, I really appreciate that very kind introduction. Um, it's really a pleasure to be able to join you all virtually at uh, your annual meeting. I'm sorry that I uh, couldn't be there in person, but uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about corporate land grabbing. Uh, Northern Plains has, as an organization, and as Dina mentioned, uh, Dina, as an executive committee member of NFFC, has been such an important part of NFFC's work since the beginning. Um, I want to just start off by saying a little bit about myself and how I arrive at this work. Um, in 2010, I started working for uh, NFS, one of NFSC's member groups, as Dina mentioned, the Rural Advancement Foundation International, which is based in North Carolina, where I am uh, originally from. And uh, I had two areas of work that I, uh, I was engaged in with Rafi, um, farmer rights in contract poultry production and rural landowner mineral rights. And this was a time when out-of-state fossil fuel speculators were coming into North Carolina uh, being discovered. And there was this rush of predatory mineral rights leases just flooding central North Carolina, where unlike Montana, uh, farmers don't have a history of mining or engaging with the fossil fuel industry. So folks were having to navigate a very predatory speculative environment uh, linked to their land. And this was really my first introduction to working with farmers on land rights issues. Um, at the same time, many of you all remember that the G DOJ hearings under the Obama administration were taking place at this time, and our organizations were mobilizing to try to defend and implement the Packers and Stockyards Act. And so I was working with poultry growers in crisis and trying to get their voices heard in D.C., and I mentioned my background here because the work I did for Rafi really gave me an important perspective on the ways in which extractive industries, both agribusiness and the fossil fuel industry, use contracts to undercut farmers' rights and livelihoods and the extreme power asymmetries between individual farmers and these multinational corporations in the absence of effective policy and regulations. And to me, that story is very simple to the conversation around land grabbing we'll have today. Uh, I also think that the intercept between livestock production in the agricultural sector and the impacts of mining in the fossil fuel industry relates very much to the work of uh, Northern Plains, which has been such a leader on these issues, not just in Montana, but in, in NFSC's world nationally. So I joined NFFC staff, uh, as was mentioned at the beginning of 2019, after working on farmer land rights issues internationally for some years. Um, and for those of you who may be less familiar with NFFC, um, NFFC was founded in 1986 as a member-based and farmer-led coalition that today represents about 100,000 small and mid-scale farmers and fishermen and ranchers across the US. Um, we are, we are, our membership consists of organizations like Northern Plains. We have about 30 member groups. Um, and the core of our work around advancing food sovereignty is acting as a bridge between our farmer members, um, like those of you in Northern Plains, and the federal government through policy advocacy. So we primarily focus on national federal policy. Uh, we also do some international policy, um, at the United Nations, which is uh, which prevents me from being with you all in person uh, today. Uh, land governance has been part of NFFC's work in various forms for decades. 
And in 2018, NFFC's board decided to make farmer land rights and fighting corporate land grabbing as a priority area of work in our current strategic framework, which is why I'm here today talking to you all, to you all about this issue. So um, with that background, let's talk about corporate land investment and land consolidation in the U.S. And um, I have a couple slides that I'm going to try to bring up, but not keep up through this talk, um, just because I think that through Zoom and uh, uh, projecting slides may be a little bit hard to read, but we'll give it a try and you all can let me know um, if, if it's helpful or not. Um, so when NFFC walk staff, when we walk into Congress to talk to lawmakers about this issue, there are three land governance moments that really shape the current policy debate around land uh, that we encounter uh, in, in Congress. And so because of the time, limited time that we have today, I'm gonna focus on those three moments to set up this conversation and give you all a perspective on our work. Uh, but I wanna acknowledge from the outset here that these three moments that I'm gonna focus on are obviously not the full story and don't do um, justice to this issue. I think it's important to say that racial equity is a key principle of NFFC. And when we talk about land on this continent, we have to acknowledge the history of genocide against indigenous people, as well as anti-black racism, particularly in agricultural lending. And it's really important, and that's a really important part of the story uh, related directly to land that continues to shape the relations between us and land in equitable ways. Uh, so NFSC has done a lot of work on racial equity and land um, following the lead of our member groups for representing farmers of color, like the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. And we released a report earlier this year with the Federation on the Black farmer experience in the South and land rights, which you can um, find on a slide that I'm going to pull up later in my talk. And I encourage you all to check that out. I'd be happy to talk about that uh, during the question answered if there's interest. Um, so the first land governance the moment or period I want to highlight that continues to have a major influence on land policy debates at the national level is at the beginning of the 1900s. Uh, so as I think most of you all know, uh, and thanks for the note in the chat, I'm not going to share slides quite yet, but I will bring them up in just a second. Um, so the, the federal government today uh, sorry, land governance in the U.S. today is primarily taking place at the state level. Uh, the federal government today only regulates non-U.S. entities by land in the U.S. So in that governance context, corporate ownership of land and community concerns about the threats of corporate consolidation of farmland um, are not new. So there are about a dozen Midwest, Midwestern states that have some kind of anti-corporate farming law uh, in place for uh, since the early 1900s. And all of those state laws are a bit different, but most of them put some kind of um, acreage limitation on any kind of agricultural corporation um, and their ability to own or lease agricultural land for production. There are about uh, then 10 more states that have limitations on foreign entities owning land. Um, and I'm going to talk more about the foreign investment dynamic in a minute, but I think it's just important to recognize that from the outset, beginning in the, in the early 1900s, there is this bifurcation of how we um, regulate corporate land investment between domestic corporations and um, foreign corporations. And that um, in general, the federal government does not have very much political power um, on either side of that, of that uh, bifurcation. Um, one thing to keep in mind also is that when we talk about these state laws that were passed, a primary concern was about consolidation and vertical, vertical integration in the farming sector by these corporate actors, not speculative investment by financial firms. And that uh, speaks to the time and financial landscape of when those uh, laws were passed at the state level. But um, as I'll, I'll mention later in my talk, um, that has really changed significantly over the last hundred years. 
So the second moment um, that I want to mention is in the 1970s. So in the 1970s, it's the Cold War. International grain markets are booming, and the cost of U.S. Far farmland are at all-time highs. And this is when we see a new wave of agricultural corp corporations backed by financial capital um, speculating on U.S. farmland in, in new and in, 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 uh, at, at a, a higher scale than we've seen before. And at the time, it was raising a lot of concerns nationally. There were international conferences about it in the U.S. Um, Congress was holding hearings on this issue. And this was a bipartisan issue. Both Democrats and Republicans were, were raising concerns about this emerging dynamic. Um, unfortunately, though, we saw that the political reaction in Congress was incredibly weak. So this is, uh, if, we, if we look at 1978, um, Senator Grassley uh, was a leader in passing their agricultural, uh, sorry, Agriculture Foreign Investment Disclosure Act, or AFIDA, in 1978. And this was sort of the pinnacle political moment of this debate happening in Congress at that time. And for uh, those who may not know, AFIDA basically mandates that foreign entities investing in farmland have to report to the USDA about where they're buying land and how much land they're buying. It's a very simple reporting requirement. It doesn't get into what they're producing or where the capital is coming from. It's really just tacking down um, the, the geographical markers of um, where that land is being bought. Um, the program is essentially voluntary because there's not really an enforcement mechanism within USDA uh, for FIDA. And as we heard in just this last September during uh, a Senate, during Senate testimony by the USDA Deputy Undersecretary, up until just last year, USDA was still uh, collecting these records for FIDA on paper. Uh, because over the last 55 years or so, Congress has never provided funding through the through appropriations to modernize and enforce the data. Um, so the takeaway here is that as in the 1970s, as the farm crisis was beginning to unfold, Congress does finally take up this issue, but chooses only to focus on foreign investment and basically giving domestic corporations a pass on, on this investment trend. Um, and only puts forward this very weak voluntary reporting framework, which then is never funded to really be um, adequate uh, in, in tracking and systematizing the tracking of those investments. So the third, third moment uh, I want to highlight here is in the late 2000s, uh, which, as I mentioned before, is, is when NFFC really starts to focus on this issue. Um, so in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis, financial corporations start speculating on agricultural farmland abroad. And I want to stress here that these are financial corporations. So they're a different set of, of entities than some of the agricultural uh, corporations that we'd seen doing some of the speculation back in the 70s. Um, and NFFC starts hearing about this issue through our involvement in uh, peasant international peasant networks like Libya Campesina, which, as Dina mentioned, was a leader for NFFC for many years. Um, so I'm going to attempt here to pull up a slide. Let's see if this works. That you all can see that. Um, sorry about this. Okay. We can see you all it. See, sure. You can see it. Okay. The problem is, is that I we can trouble. see it. You can see it, but uh, you're able to see the whole slide or my whole screen. The whole screen. 
the whole screen. I'm just trying to get it into presentation mode, but the settings are not getting me there. Okay, so I'm going to abandon this effort, and we I will share those slides with you all after. I apologize for that because I'm not able to actually get to the drop down menu to do the slideshow. Um, so one of the key actors in this land grabbing um, trend that we see emerging after the 2008 financial crisis um, is a financial organization called the Teachers Insurance and Annuity Association of, of America, or TIAA. And TIAA is a financial, US-based financial institution that invests in pensions for a lot of different kinds of public sector and nonprofit workers. Uh, but university faculty in particular um, is one of their key, um, uh, uh, key, key groups of people that they serve. Um, and they were one of the first corporate entities to develop this speculative land investment model. So they have been investing um, in industrial agriculture in places like the Northeast of Brazil, um, in the region called the Sahado that's right next to the Amazon since 2008. And the slide I was going to show you was um, a demonstration of the different regions of the world that are both um, places, sources of capital for investment, as well as places that are being targeted for investment. Um, and to explain that slide a little bit, it's just that places like the US are both funding investment abroad, but they're also receiving um, investment from entities from other countries. The same goes for Brazil. Um, Europe is a, another example. There is a fair amount of investment happening in Eastern Europe, but um, European pension funds like TIAA are also investing heavily um, in the global south, uh, particularly in Brazil. Um, this is important to mention here that um, as we were, as NFSC, we were hearing about these investment um, trends happening in places um, like Brazil, um, these stories were being linked to some very serious allegations of human rights abuses. Um, okay, sorry, I'll pause here. I'm seeing that in the chat, we're gonna we wanna try to um, enlarge the picture again. So let me try this one more time from the beginning. All right, let me know if that if that is working for you all, because if I uh, do presentation mode, I can no longer um, access the other Zoom tools. So is, is that helpful for you all to see? I can also zoom in on my slides if that's helpful, but- It shows the whole screen. It's good, it's good, Jordan. Okay, great. So this is the, this is the map I just explained. Um, so areas in green that you may not be able to see, the text there are um, countries that um, are both receiving investment as well as funding investment. Countries that, uh, so the US, North America, uh, Brazil, Argentina, uh, Australia, um, as we have places that are in red, which are Europe, which are primarily funding. So Western Europe funding uh, and Northern Europe are funding uh, investment abroad. Um, and then places um, that are in orange, which are primarily just receiving um, those investments uh, and not funding investments elsewhere. Um, so as we were hearing about uh, these stories coming particularly from Brazil, from our partners in Via Campesina and elsewhere, um, we were hearing how these investments were being linked to very serious um, human rights abuses, um, folks getting um, violently displaced from their lands, um, uh, as well as uh, some pretty terrible environmental degradation happening. Um, this, you know, this is funding primarily uh, monocrop extensive soybean production for animal feed um, and uh, with few institutions regulating things like dumping of pesticides and waterways 
um, that was also displacing uh, rural communities um, uh, because they no longer had access to drinking water. Um, and the other, there are also some very serious allegations around corruption of um, you know, local corporations that were linked to these investments, um, uh, doing things like bribing judges and actually falsifying land deeds. Um, TIA is not the only actor in that story. Harvard University Endowment is also a major player in investments in Brazil. Um, but uh, over time and over the last years, um, our partners on the ground in Brazil um, have done an extensive documentation of those impacts. Um, and uh, have, we don't have time to go into that more now, but I'm happy to share those reports uh, with you if you would like. Um, so the important thing here to mention around how these companies are showing up in countries ab abroad is that over the last 15 years, we've seen these same actors migrating those investment um, strategies back to the US. I'm gonna move here to this next slide. So. Um, this is a this is an outdated picture of where TIA is investing um, in the U.S. Um, TIA uh, have, does voluntary reporting uh, where they invest, so we know that this is out of date, and we are not convinced that their reports actually disclose all of their investments. But um, they are investing in things in um, like vineyards in California, um, significant amount. Of commodity crop production in the Midwest and Mississippi Delta region, but they're also investing throughout the entire um, uh, food system. So they're investing in processing, agricultural inputs, fishery sector, uh, waste management. They have their fingers in a lot of different parts of our food system. Um, and I think the important thing to mention here is that unlike the 1970s, where we had agricultural co uh, corporations backed by financial capital, um, these financial companies, um, the scale is really different. So we're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars being invested in land um, in the U.S. by these financial firms and trillions of dollars at the global level. Um, the other difference is that um, the, from what we can tell, these investments happening in the U.S., they, these financial firms are not getting direct involved in the production practices happening on the land itself. And that's a really important difference and it's partially because of the anti-corporate farming laws that are happening at the state level. They can skirt those anti-corporate farming laws by saying we're not involved in agricultural production. They use the terminology of separating the land base from the farm. So they're actually just in, in investing in the land as a commodity, um, but not actually involved in, um, in the food system in their words. Um, I think it's really important to highlight the fact that um, they are not investing in like small scale diversified farms. This is dumping money into large scale agribusiness commodity crop production. Um, and so that is obviously really shaping um, how folks get onto the land and how they maintain their land um, in, in, in these different regions of the country. And I mentioned before that uh, we've worked with the Federation on, um, on doing interviews with uh, Black farmers in the Mississippi Delta because it is one of those target areas for this investment to understand how these investments are showing up um, in their community. And um, aside from the racialized impacts of Black farmers uh, who are, you know, face crisis like farmers everywhere, but Black farmers in particular in the in the South have the added challenge of not having secure land rights. So heirs property owners, who, farmers who have inherited land but been, been denied uh, because of racism access to the justice system and do not have a probate will are at more risk from these investors who in some cases are able to approach a, a, a family members who jointly own land uh, and force a, an auction of that land and then outbid the family members to be able to take that land over. So there is an added um, um, threat there for Black farmers. Uh, in particular, um, Indigenous farmers face um, a similar dynamic 
Um, but nationally, we also know that uh, because of our uh, close work with the National Young Farmers Coalition, that access to land, to land is the number one challenge for new beginning farmers. Um, so I think we have probably all heard a number of times how um, 40% of farmland in the U.S. is expected to change hands in the next decade. Um, and so the stakes are pretty high for rural America um, as this um, influx of uh, speculative capital um, comes into the U.S. How this is going to reshape um, the face of rural communities in terms of who is on the land and what kind of production is happening in that land, but also how this is exact, exacerbating already, um, you know, pretty significant um, concentrate corporate concentration issues, you know, from vertical integration to, um, you know, buying up critical local food infrastructure. Um, we believe that um, this in speculative investment, particularly in land, but also in other parts of our food system, um, is is going to uh, exacerbate all of those ch challenges. Um, so in my last minutes here, I want to talk about what NFFC has been doing on this issue. So um, as we have heard these stories and tracked this issue for um, the last 15 years, um, we have seen well, first that there is a lack of um, data and a lack of information on how this trend is showing up nationally. And so we started um, a collaborative research pro project um, with the University of California at Santa Cruz that, and the Federation that um, uh, generated the report that I just showed you on the last slide. But we also worked with the Vermont Law School to do a systematic analysis of all existing federal uh, policy, federal law, federal policy that touches on this issue. And through that work, we were uh, able to generate some um, publicity uh, in the media around these issues. Um, and that together with the advocacy of our member groups on the ground, pushing on this issue for so many years, we were able to um, begin working with Senator Cory Booker's office at the beginning of this year to write the Farmland for Farmers Act, which was introduced in the Senate um, at the end of July. And um, I'm happy to go into as many of the weedy details as you all would like on this particular bill, but uh, I hope you all can see these bullet points but give you an overview of the bill itself. Um, and I'll just highlight them really quickly. Um, the core premise of the bill is about regulating not the land, but the corporate entities that are investing in that land. So we name things like corporations, private equity firms, pension investment funds. And we say that unless they meet certain conditions, they cannot invest in new farmland nationally. Um, we have some pretty clear uh, market transparency pieces of the bill that would prevent um, multi-level subsidiary structures from investing in farmland because we see this, and this is a new trend of corporations hiding their investments through this very uh, opaque legal structures because they don't wanna be accountable. And so folks do not know which corporations are showing up in the communities and it takes academic researchers at you know, the University of California Santa Cruz to actually go to the Register of Deeds office and sift through those deeds and then do a bunch of online research um, to try to figure out who owns these lands. And so um, this part of the bill would actually sort of eliminate um, that tactic used by corporate actors. Um, we do wanna make sure that there are exemptions for family scale um, corporations. We, with a lot of farmers in our network, use the corporate structure for their businesses. The goal of this is not to um, impact them, but we're trying to look at speculative investments by financial firms. And so we have a number of exemptions in the bill that um, allow folks who are working the land and may have some shareholders, but at a, at a family scale, um, who would not be impacted by this bill. I will say though that um, there is not a like uh, silver bullet to figure out how to regulate corporations. It is 
it's legally extremely complicated to figure out legal definitions and weed out the bad guys and not impact um, farmers who use a corporate structure. Um, so we're, we have done a lot of consultation and research on how to get as close as we can um, to the, the right um, land on, on that issue in the way that we, we think is right. Uh, um, we also exempt things like research institutions and nonprofits who are you know, doing a lot of important work of doing innovative land access models, um, uh, but it's not an easy task. Um, the third, the, the other piece here that I mentioned that is mentioned here is that we explicitly say that states have a legal right to regulate corporations at the state level. And that is in direct response to um, agribusiness attacking current state level into corporate farming laws. And I think we should here give a shout out to um, some other work members who have been defending those, those uh, state level laws for years now. Um, that has been a really challenging fight. Uh, and we want to bolster that state level work. We're trying to push back um, at that state governance level. Uh, and then finally, we say that, you know, we, the, we don't believe that the Congress has the legal authority to force corporations to um, sell land. Um, and we know that land concentration is already at a significant level. Um, but what we can do is we can say that corporations who do not abide um, by these programs are cut off from USDA programs that are meant for family farmers. So um, access to credit programs, as well as including guaranteed lending, um, as, and as well as any other kind of program benefit. So we know that corporations are using USDA programming meant for um, working farmers, and they're using those programs to de-risk um, their investments. So we don't think that's right, and this bill takes that away. Um, so, Sorry to rush through um, those last points on the bill itself, but um, our member, I'll just conclude by saying that our members are really excited about this bill because it's actually putting a legal framework at the national level on the table in a farm bill year that has never been there before. So this is really expanding the range of possibilities um, for regulating corporate investment. Um, we need a lot of collective work amongst our, our members to uh, get that over the finish line in this very contentious Congress. And so we'd be really excited to, to work with you, all of you all to do that um, at the national level. There's a whole lot of work that could be done at the state level as well. And be happy to, to talk about that more. Back to you, Dina. Thank you, Jordan. And I'm sure there are lots of questions. So if you have a question, if you'd come to the microphone and line up behind the microphone and ask questions. Well, I saw that uh, on the uh, list in the bill, you are exempting nonprofit corporations. TIAA is a nonprofit corporation. How do you deal with them? Yeah, it's a really good point. Um, so be because of the, the scale of their investments, we do think, and again, this is not me, my speculation, but we have had a number of attorneys, including um, the Senate um, Agriculture um, Council weigh in on that exact kind of question. And um, the goal here is that we are trying to differentiate um, nonprofit entities that are within NFFC's membership that are doing land access um, uh, projects to try to get particularly new and beginning farmers on the land. And they're doing it, you know, as their name suggests, and they're not extracting profit um, from, from that process. The difference for TIA is that TIA itself is indeed a nonprofit, now a nonprofit entity, but all of their agricultural investments are going through corporate firms. So TIA is not the one that's on the leases. They are going through their main farmland investment arm is Naveen, which is not a nonprofit. It's, it's, a, it's a corporate entity. And so again, this gets back to this point that there's this complex legal structure 
that these financial institutions are using to try to circumvent existing regulations, um, um, this bill, if enacted, would um, you know, prevent that from happening. Um, if TIA were to completely redefine their investment strategy and be direct investors and land through that nonprofit entity, that would be a really interesting conversation to have. I don't think that they're going to do that. They 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 have never done that before. So um, the same thing can be said for Bill Gates. You know, Bill Gates' name is linked to this massive scale of investing across the country. Uh, he's the biggest landowner, individual landowner um, in the U.S. But he all those investments are happening through corporate entities. So. Um, you know, this bill would also push back on um, this idea that, you know, it would limit his investment strategy and in the way that he's using corporate entities to do that. Um, if he individually wanted to buy up all those pieces of land and put his name on those deeds, this bill would not, um, uh, would not be able to address that. The bill does not address individual um, land ownership in that way. But again, that's not the trend in the legal structures that are being used for this uh, these speculative investments right now. Gary? Okay, thank you so much for your informative presentation and your work on protecting family farms. I was just curious whether you think that conservation easements are helpful in this process. Yeah, it's a really good question, and I'll be honest with you that I, I, I don't do a lot of work on conservation easements. I, I do know that um, a number of our member groups, you know, particularly uh, folks like the Federation, are hesitant, um, some farmers in that network have been hesitant to use um, conservation easements in the way that they do limit farmers' ability to um, access some programs and credit, and so it limits the mobility of farmers, particularly those who are discriminated in other ways. Um, I also think that there is um, there is a trend increasingly that these financial institutions are trying to um, buy up land to put it into conservation um, or buy up land in order to access um, things like carbon sequestration programs. And so I think that conservation easements um, are a tool. I don't think that they're a particularly strong tool for addressing this um, consolidation trend as we see it now. Yeah. Yep. Yes, my name is Jill Stockton. Um, I've got a, a question, but I, I wanted to do a little point of history. Um, Jordan said that uh, he started his uh, career with RAFI. Uh, what does RAFI stand for? The Rural Advancement Foundation International. All right. In 1987, uh, someone from RAFI, Benny Button was his name, came and spoke at our annual meeting. And he, he was a poultry producer and he warned us of what happened in the, uh, um, to the poultry industry. And he said, don't let that happen to the cattle industry. Don't become a surf in your own land. And uh, mm -hmm. and uh, Steve and Jeannie Charter, uh, Bill Milton, uh, Ellen Waller, who all was there? Anyway, that was the beginning of our livestock uh, uh, task force. Right. So, so we owe a lot to Benny Budding and um, uh, Raffi. Here in Montana, we have a, a little bit different situation of how these these out of state or international. Um, organizations, uh, corporations, and persons are by buying our land. And and I have a personal situation from where I'm situated in central Montana. To the south of me, uh, a pair of uh, brothers from, millionaire brothers from Texas, 
and hmm? uh, 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 purchase a, a number of ran land, uh, ranches put it all together, uh, 200,000 acres. And their main focus is a uh, personal hunting preserve. So there's something like 8,000 elk in a hunting district that should have 700 elk. And of course, the the public has no access, it's all private land to the, to those elk. Uh, so the elk was all on their land during hunting season and on my land <laughs> the rest of the year. Uh, to the north of me is another form of colonialization called the American Prairie Reserve, whose long-term plan is to rewild the Missouri Breaks, basically. Um, block it together in a three million acre block where they would have uh, wild uh, bison roaming. Uh, my neighbors have problems forms of uh, colonialization, that's what I call it. Uh, we're very much more angry against the American uh, Prairie Reserve and kind of hypocritically quiet about the uh, Wilkes brothers. But I wonder if you have any insights on those uh, types of corporate control of, uh, of our land. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, I appreciate that history. I, I still work very closely with Benny Bunning. Um, and I just wanted to take a moment to just say that one form um, that we've learned through the work that we do on poultry um, that in, that uh, of, of this land investment model that we're quite concerned about is that we're we've started hearing some media in West Virginia of poultry com companies actually buying up the land that um, poultry houses are going on. And to me, this is um, sort of the next generation of the vertical integration story that we see in poultry. Um, and but and so the workaround preventing corporate land investment, I think, um, could stave off that next chapter of vertical integration in the, in the livestock industry. Um, and uh, I think there's an interesting um, um, moment of or a potential moment for power building there between folks who've been involved in livestock um, and this land investment trend. Um, but to get to your, the second point of your your question, so I'm not familiar um, with those particular investments that you um, that you mentioned, but the story that you tell about um, sort of environmental enclosures um, is is it, I've heard this so many times, um, and it's definitely um, part of this story of 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 power over land and in, in, in consolidation of land. And it's not unique to the U.S. Obviously, we um, begin reserves in Africa. Have been dealing with you know, communities there. I've been dealing with this for for quite a while now. Um, in the context of just, but just to answer to bring your your point to this bill, I think it is important to acknowledge, and, and we're very straightforward that the bill that we're proposing here is not a is, is not going to fix all the problems of. Um, corporate consolidation or corporate land ownership um, that we see. We, um, Senator Booker's office, um, made a strategic decision in drafting this bill that it was only going to focus on agricultural land, and we really pushed them um, to include forestry, because TIA uh, in particular is very invested in the forestry sector, particularly in the Northeast. Um, but agriculture, uh, land use for other things like um, hunting or environmental conservation would not be impacted by this bill. And I think that you know we could have a long debate on whether putting everything in one bill or having um, multiple different bills with similar tactics, having a more decentralized sort of political advocacy approach or, or better and worse. But in this case, this bill is focused um, just on agricultural and forest land. And we feel like the opposition and the political blowback that we're getting from industry on this um, and the opposition um, is is enough. Um, this, this, this 
the, the, the forces that are trying to oppose this bill are strong. Um, and I think, but to me, that is an indicator of success that we're really pushing on some legal instruments and tools that haven't been there before that actually would unwind some of that corporate power. Um, you know, finally, I'll just say on that, on that issue, we haven't heard any, like, we have not been slammed by any members of Congress on this bill yet. There's a number of um, members of Congress who say, we're not going to get on this bill publicly, but we're not going to fight it privately. And I think that's a really interesting um, feedback loop that we're hearing that um, I think that there, the fact that I, something like um, almost every single state in the country, including obviously Montana, has passed some kind of land investment bill in the last few years. So there is a lot of resentment um, and, and um, concern at the local level, as you all are very familiar. And in some ways, our political system at the state level is responding to that. We don't believe that any of the state laws that have been passed in the last few years are actually getting at the source of the problem. Too often, we're focusing on foreign investment, foreign investment, which is a very small minority of the investments um, taking place. And, and instead, we really need to be focusing on U.S. domestic corporations because they are the ones who are building the strength. I see our line is getting long and our time is getting short. So if you could make your questions a little shorter, come on. So I'll try to have a short question, but I can't speak for how long the answer is. Uh, <laughs> yep. Oh, well, that's easy to say too. Just pull it down. Okay. I'm pretty new, so I'm more familiar with what goes on in, say, the housing sector. And what I'm curious about is, is the more curious about the 40% of the U.S. farmland that's going to be changing hands. And so that's what I'm asking about, because I'm, I'm hearing more about um, um, ways of... Um, dealing with development rights, I guess trusts, I think they are, that can help out somebody who feels like they need to sell the land or need to sell the land, but being able to do it in a way that doesn't, um, that allows um, regular people to buy the land um, while they still get what they need from the land. Um, and so I'm wondering if that's something that we're already addressing at NPRC or, or if there's something that you wanted to say about it, uh, just how to keep it, because we're seeing it in housing too, that swaths of towns are being protected from spikes in um, speculation and so forth. Um, and it seems like it's similar. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I'll, I'll try to answer it really quickly. So the 40% number is, um, you know, th that is referring to uh, the fact that we have an aging farming population and folks are going to be aging out of the sector. And so um, that 40% of land is not necessarily all going to um, go like make it to um, is up for purchase. A lot of that land is going to be inherited, right? Um, but that there's also not a lot of young people who want to get in farming these days. And so I do think that a significant amount of land is going to be up for grabs. Um, we I think we all know that um, farmers invest their retirement um, in their in their assets in the land, and so um, we we are very sympathetic to farmers um, being able to get the best price for that agricultural land. Um, at the same time, um, you know most of the farmers I think in our network feel that they do not want to have a legacy of their farm um, being you know tied up in uh, a corporate ownership. They want to pass it on to another um, independent farmer. And so our feeling is that if corporations are taken, um, speculative corporate investment is taken out of land markets, that that is um, going to take a significant pressure off of new and beginning farmers who want to get into land and find, and find that land. Um, so that's that is sort of our approach. Corporations who currently own land don't have to they don't have to sell it, but they can't sell it to another corporation. They eventually will have to send it to someone who's actually working on it. So that uh, is sort of our approach. 
but um, you know we're up against uh, a ticking clock here, and um, our our governance system in Congress is just not really fast enough on the issue. Thanks, Steve. We have time for one more question, so you're it. Yes, Jordan, you mentioned uh, earlier on that one of the biggest problems for uh, especially beginning farmers and ranchers is access to the land. And at this point, land ownership is kind of out of the question for for most people. So um, the, these co companies that invest, they're uh, putting their it, it's for industrial agriculture, but is there a way we could shift it around where these investors could still invest, but instead of uh, leasing to uh, industrial, if they could uh, le lease to uh, family farmers and ranchers and people who are in interested in regenerative agriculture. And you mentioned one of the big investors is teachers. Well, I I'm sure if they had the choice of where their money would go, it, it would be to uh, get that into uh, family farmers, ranchers. So I wonder if there's any kind of movement to uh, do something like that. Yeah, thank you for that. Really important points, and I wish I had more time to respond to all of them. But um, the question about is there an investment model that is really, you know, supporting new and beginning farmers, um, that's something that is debated a lot in our work. And to be honest with you, I'm not convinced that there is a model where these corporations are legally bound to make a profit for their shareholders, that that model can work with new beginning farmers who, um, as you all know, really it's it's a struggle to get a, a farming operation up and off the ground, and there's no extra profit to to skim off the top for an investor uh, in most cases. So I'm not I haven't seen a, an investment model that I would be comfortable signing off on. Doesn't mean it couldn't happen. Um, what we do really support, though, are public investments and land access programs. So we work with the National Land Farmers. There's another bill that I didn't talk about today that tries to put public funding towards helping folks get onto the land. Um, another one of our member groups, Agrarian Trust, has a uh, philanthropy-driven land access approach that helps get young people onto the land um, through uh, through grants. Uh, it's another model. We support that as well. But the profit-driven investment model, I'm not sure, works for new beginning farmers. Uh, and then the second point to your uh, of your of your um, of your um, we have done a lot of work around organizing on campuses to inform teachers uh, about this investment dynamic and where their 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 retirement funds are going. Most of the time, when we talk to teachers, you're exactly right. They are really concerned. They do not want their worker pensions being pitted against, um, you know, the retirements of farmers in their land. And so uh, we have passed, I think, about a dozen Senate faculty resolutions at um, about a dozen universities um, calling for, for divestment on this. So there is a lot of work happening um, at that level on campuses uh, to inform folks and, and do policy organizing. Thank you so much, Jordan, especially for zooming in all the way from Europe. I'm hoping you're having some, some luck with the FAO, Food and Agricultural Organization. And it was very informative, and we will just keep giving you more information as National Family Farm Coalition keeps working on this program to tell you what you can do policy-wise and what you can do otherwise, like the students and the faculty and the alumni of Harvard are urging their university to stop investing in harmful destructive practices that they are currently engaging in. So there are things that can be done besides policy issues too, and we'll try to keep you informed. So thank you so much, Jordan, for your presentation. Thank you, Dean. I really appreciate the opportunity. We have an action alert uh, with Rafi on this issue. I'm happy to share that with you and, and, the, and, your, and the Northern Plains membership and just appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all today. Thank you.